My name is Emily Long. Ooh, sorry, I just got a thing saying recording in progress. Um, my name is Emily Long. I am the Area 2 Cultural Resource Specialist or Archaeologist for the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So I cover um, a third of the state and I provide um, support for different practices and projects uh, for the NRCS before any practices are put in. So I make sure to see if there's anything prehistoric or historic. And yeah, that's Carla said. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about archaeology. It is definitely a passion of mine. I can definitely get into the weeds very, very quickly. So if at any point you have questions, please ask, because that is what I am here for. All right. Thanks. There we go. So yeah. with the NRC, at, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Emily, if you want to put your, I don't know if, what screen you're looking at, but it looks like you're not on presentation mode. So just to let you know. Um, huh, it is on my screen. That's not good. Let's see. Oh. Hmm. Maybe it's the type of screen I'm sharing. Let's see. I, I see. Okay. Let's change that. Yeah, it's showing here. I'm going to stop share. Sorry about that, guys. Let me try one more time. See if it'll actually show this page. Is that better? Yeah, that's the presentation mode. Perfect. Thank okay. All right. Thank you for giving me a heads up. Um, so with uh, the NRCS and archaeology, uh, because we are a federally um, funded agency and we provide federal funding, um, we do need to make sure that there isn't anything prehistoric or historic when we're implementing practices. And so we are required by law uh, to check and make sure there isn't anything there before we do different kinds of practices. So I'm having a little trip. There we go. Um, so NRCS recognizes that culture. And I promise we'll actually get into what our culture resources. This is just the layout first to get going. Um, so cultural resources are an important part of our natural heritage. and We need to protect them. Um, we will identify, record, and protect cultural resources early in the planning and environmental evaluation phase. So for those of you already with uh, NRCS contracts, that is why you'll see like all kinds of paperwork and red tape about cultural resources. Um, it is our policy to protect cultural resources in their original place to the fullest extent practical. And we will provide information and training to our field personnel, interested parties, and so on to ensure maximum consideration of cultural resources. And when we're talking about NRCS cultural resource areas, here are three areas um, split up. You can see, so for my area too, I, um, I pretty close all the way over, um, like with Fort Collins, Larimer County, um, down to Flagler, Hugo. It's like we're, we're split up into these pretty, pretty big areas and do a lot of work. My um, other colleagues, we are currently hiring a er new Area 1 archaeologist. And Michael um, Troyer is our Area 3 archaeologist. So these are our three areas. And then getting into the fun stuff. What is archaeology? Well, archaeology is all about the study of the human past through what people leave behind. And when I do a lot of teaching about archaeology, um, what we really have to focus on is the human part. Um, yeah, fossils are cool. Dinosaurs are cool. All these different things are great. Um, and same with like text and all this stuff. But what we very specifically focus on as archaeologists are the tangible remains of what's left behind. So like historians will focus, uh oh, I missed you guys. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, one of the little cameras went away. So I just wanted to make sure I didn't uh lose internet. Yeah, um phew, I was worried. Um so when we're looking at archaeology, so historians, they definitely look, they look at um, what people wrote in the past. We're really looking more at like literally what people throw away or what they just leave behind. And so a cultural resource um, are all those different tangible aspects of the past. It can be a projectile point or an arrowhead that is, you know, 12,000 years old, or it could be a beer can that was thrown out in the 1970s. So we've got this huge, huge range of things that could be considered a cultural resource, or an 
artifact or these things that archaeologists have to look at. And so it can feel kind of funny when you're, you know, you're researching and you're studying things from when there were mammoths all the way to some beer cans that were tossed out of somebody's truck. So big span to look at. Uh, in the United States and with federal law, anything that is 50 years old or older um, is considered a cultural resource. So that is a constantly moving target. So anything from 1974 on, it's considered a cultural resource and things that we have to look at and consider. These things can be arrowheads, pottery, tin cans, glass bottles. Um, it can include buildings, um, structures, so old barns, all the way to the pyramids and all of these things that could be potentially on our National Register of Historic Places or could be eligible to be on this register. So again, like a huge range of things. Um, in the pictures here, we have rock art, we've got coffee cans, and we've got prehistoric pottery. So it's just, it's incredible the different kinds of things um, that we could be looking at. When we're looking at the archaeology of Colorado, we have a huge span of time to be looking at. Some of the earliest uh, known archaeological sites um, in Colorado are at least datable, meaning like we have an actual ex pretty solid date for things, um, is from uh, 9200 BC. And this is considered um, the early Paleo-Indian period. And so when we're looking at archaeology, we've got these different sites all over Colorado. And these all tend to be buried. So these aren't things that you'd easily find on the ground surface. So if I'm walking, surveying, um, working on an RCS project, it is very, 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 very unlikely I would ever find something like this unless it's in a really churned up farm field and we're digging extremely deeply. Because otherwise most of this stuff you would see in excavations. And this is a period where we have spears being used, um, you know, hunting mammoth and other really big game. Um, and here we have, it's called a Clovis point, and it's just a different kind of spear. Um, and that would be attached to uh, a wooden staff. And then you would throw it either by hand or using this cool thing called an atlatl, which would help you throw the spear. And if you ever get a chance to add like a an archaeology fair or something like that, and they're throwing spears with these atlatl tools. It is really fun, and I highly recommend it. But this is the oldest we have in Colorado. And as we're moving along, and I'm jumping a lot of periods in time because I, I could get into the weeds very quickly with this kind of stuff. Um, we're getting into like the prehistoric and protohistoric part of Colorado. We're moving along thousands and thousands of years. Um, big game slowly going extinct. People are um, not moving as much of the landscape. They're starting to settle down more. Um, and then we get into the proto-historic, and that means there are um, Europeans in the state, but they may have not necessarily come into contact with indigenous peoples yet. Um, so in Colorado, one of the um, very unique indigenous groups um, were the ancestral Puebloans. Uh, we used to use the term Anasazi, but that is considered um, a derogatory term for the descendants of the ancestral Puebloans today. And so we say ancestral Puebloan. And so they were in, hopefully you guys can see my laser pointer here, um, in this region of Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, um, here in this nice little blob right in that area. Um, and this is the Four Corners region. So if you know Cortez, um, Mesa Verde, this is where the ancestral Puebloans lived in Colorado. And they had these incredible cliff dwellings. And so if we're looking as archeologists on the landscape, we would see these really incredible structures up in cliff dwellings and like in caves and stuff where they built towers and homes and that kind of thing. And um, uh, outside of these cliff dwellings, they. They grew corn, um, they would have other large villages, and they made some of the most beautiful pottery. You can see some of that over here. As an archaeologist, what we mostly see on the landscape when we're moving around are just broken pieces of this pottery. So you can imagine you're walking along in a farm field, rangeland, it'd be very easy to spot right away that super white black pottery. So those white and black designs and just seeing those little pieces. And so my colleague who used to work in area one in that um, Cortez area, they were constantly running in to different kinds of sites because this pottery is everywhere. Other types of things you would see are arrowheads um, and these different shapes and the different shapes of arrowheads can help you tell what time period it is based on the shape of the arrowhead and what other cultures they may have been in contact with. 
Um, this pottery, um, the materials to make arrowheads, they were traded throughout Colorado. So we'll see pieces of this pottery potentially all the way up in Denver. Um, and so it's it's a very uh, big item that people traded at that time. And so the ancestral Puebloans were around in Colorado from about 100 to 1600 AD. So the Spanish were um, in Colorado by this time. And uh, the ancestral Puebloans pretty much moved out of the region or they moved into other areas um, by the time of Spanish exploration by 1540. Um, so there wasn't really much contact with them. That was usually with later groups. And it's thought because of drought and um, big populations, famine, that kind of stuff. And so we have these different moving groups across the landscape. And if you saw on that map, like the Fremont, like that's another group. And so th there's a lot of interaction. Um, Ancestral Puebloans was just one of the big groups. We do know that the um, Ute people, um, the Ute tribes were in Colorado um, uh, at least by 1500 AD, if not earlier. And they moved um, throughout Colorado and they are considered the oldest continuous residents of Colorado. And so that's pretty cool. Um, you can see in the map, like the extent of um, where they used to live um, and uh, where they would move. They were a migrating group. They uh, would move seasonally. And so as archeologists, what, what are we looking for in the landscape? We're looking for rock art. And so they would have images of antelope, bears, um, different plants. Um, they had, and still today, um, incredible beadwork. And so we'd be looking at moccasins, cradle boards, all kinds of beautiful beadwork. And then the type of housing they used were very similar to teepees. They're called wickiups. And um, when moving during like the summer months, and they're up in the mesas, up in Rocky Mountain National Park, the huge area they went, they would put these um, poles together and maybe lean against a tree, that kind of stuff. And then um, temporary, easy structure, put brush around it, and that would be um, your temporary house moving around. And so today, we'll still find the poles leaning up against trees. Um, they're very fragile and very rare um, in some areas where there's a lot of fire. And so when we do find these, it's, it's, it's special and they are considered um, incredibly important to um, the uh, descendants of the historic youth. So the current youth today. Yeah. Is, is there a way that you can, besides like looking at how old the materials are for those type of um, structures to know like, are they actually like very old or someone was just like, I don't know. Mess it around. It, yeah, and build it for fun or something. Oh yeah, no, that's an, a really good question. I have a lot of projects up in the Estes Park area and there are a lot of summer camps and they make a ton of teepees and wiki ups type structures up in these summer camps. So yeah, we have to have a way to know. A good way to know is whether or not things were ax cut or cut with saws or like modern machinery or with a knife. And so we can look at how things were cut. Um, mm -hmm. We can look at like the growth and lichen and wear and tear on the poles. And so it's that kind of thing. And then looking at like the size and main, um, like how, how weathered they are at the base, what's been grown up around them, have they been moved a lot? Um, and then looking for artifacts around that. So a big one is the artifacts. You might yeah. find um, charcoal in the soil where there was a hearth, you might find where people are making stone tools. Um, so you might find the little bits and pieces of rock. So yeah, there's a different ways. It's not easy to date them, but it's at least easier to just be, at least be able to say this one is at the very least old. Yeah. Nice. It, get, it gets tricky. And a lot of times there's only maybe two or three of these um, poles left. Um, just from wear and tear. So it gets, it's exciting when you find them and you also have to be very careful not to just be right away like, oh, it's a wiki up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, other groups moved into Colorado um, at like throughout a huge period of time, but we know at the very least that by the early 1800s, there's the Cheyenne and Arapaho in the plains. Um, you got the um, Kiowas and Comanches in the south. Um, got the um, Pawnee groups um, by the Republican River, and sometimes the Sioux um, uh, 
in different areas of um, around the Cheyenne and Arapaho land. So we've got big groups of Plains um, tribes in Colorado too, out in the Plains areas. And we would be looking for uh, teepee rings. Um, so the rocks that would help hold down the canvas or the hides of teepees, um, looking for hards. And then the big one too are always stone tools. Um, stone tools are the main thing that help actually remain on the landscape. They don't deteriorate as much. Um, might find pottery, but it's that stuff deteriorates pretty quickly too, just by the way it was made. And at this point too, um, different groups are making metal arrowheads out of like cans, little pieces of sheet metal. And so you might find some of that too. So that's what we're looking for. So in general, um, the Native American groups of Colorado and that still um, claim uh, descendants and like having that as their traditional homelands of Colorado um, are the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, um, Pueblo tribes, the Shoshone, the Ute, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and the Navajo. And so um, in my work, um, depending where certain uh, sites are found, I will consult with um, the tribal governments and what they may be concerned about. As we're moving into the historic period, um, it's important to remember that like this is still a period with a, a lot of indigenous groups. It's just, there's a lot to cover. <laughs> and so we have um, in 1541, the Spanish explorer Coronado may have crossed the Southeastern corner of the state. And when we're looking for that, might be finding Spanish coins, little bits of armor, or we might find um, like interactions with different um, indigenous groups that like, why would they have, you know, a coin or this kind of design on their pottery if they hadn't met with a, the Spanish type of thing? So we're looking for those types of interactions as well. Um, by 1682, the explorer La Salle um, appropriates for France all the area known as Colorado east of the Rocky Mountains. So here we get that push and pull back and forth between like France owns it, Spain owns it, now it's American. Now it's this, whereas you have indigenous groups be like, this is our land. So there's a lot of push and pull there. Um, in the, by 1803, through the Louisiana Purchase signed by President Thomas Jefferson, the United States acquires Eastern Colorado. And so by that point, we're getting a lot of fur trading and um, these posts expanding for specifically fur trading. We haven't gotten into mining quite yet. By 1851, we have the first permanent non-Indian settlement in Colorado. Um, founded at Coneos in the San Luis Valley. And the image we see here is um, potentially part of the, like the oldest church um, at Coneos. Um, a lot of structures at that time would have still been built of like adobe brick and rock, um, a lot of Spanish influences there. And um, uh, that's really that all remains, but we get a lot of very cool um forts and uh, cabins and farms and stuff within these regions that we're looking at. Um, a lot of the historic sites that we find are kind of from the mining period on. We still get, um, and when you're in the San Luis Valley, uh, wonderful um, like examples of um, Spanish cemeteries, adobe structures, a lot of things that you typically would see in New Mexico. Um, in, in that part of Colorado. It's just really beautiful and it's incredible how well that adobe has preserved. And during this time, we have a lot of treaties that were made and broken and then gold was discovered and then just everything exploded for mining. And so with the 1850s, the discovery of gold placers, we've got crazy mining industries and camps and towns. Um, and then you get the railways and factories and irrigation systems. And so a lot of what we see with the NRCS um, is kind of this period on um, with a lot of the work we do with irrigation ditches, um, old mining towns, uh, foundations, cabins, ranches, um, might have the old berms and railway ties from um, no longer used train tracks. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's what we're looking for in the landscape might be like parts of an old ditch, like just the the impression in the soil, or you might just have the berm from the train. Um, there was one site I was looking at, all the railroad ties were gone and somebody had then built a house from those railroad ties. And it was the ugliest house I had ever seen because um, the, you know, the railroad ties are pretty short 
And then they smell of that like um, creosote. And so somebody made a very small, weird looking <laughs> in the late 1800s from these old railroad ties. We got 1861, Colorado becomes a state. Um, in 1864, during these this period, we're still, ha we're having increasing conflict between settlers um, and indigenous groups. Um, and then by 1881, we have the forced removal of the Utes from their traditional lands to reservations. Um, so from the um, Sand Creek Massacre through the um, removal of the Utes, um, unfortunately, we have, because of this very concrete um, periods where we can say for different Native American sites, this is definitely from before that period because these people were then removed um, from that point on. So for finding something like we call them peeled trees, um, they're culturally modified trees where you're trying to get to the inner bark and the pith to make cradle boards or um, for medicine. Um, we know they have to date prior to 1881. And then so the tree so that we know it is a peeled tree has to be 200 years older, older type of thing. So with these historic dates, um, it gets, uh, it gives us a very concrete stop point in many respects. Um, as we're looking at like historic periods on, we do see a lot of the closing of historic mines. And so there on the landscape, there are a lot of old schools. Um, almost every um, town had a, a school. And so when we're looking at historic landscapes, you might find the foundations of one, or you might find the cellar from part of a school. Um, so we're just, there's a lot of unique things on the landscape that we'll be looking for of collapsed buildings, foundations, um, all the way to coffee cans, to the soles of shoes, um, different types of nails, all this stuff to help us figure out what historic period are we in in Colorado? And then um, what can we associate it with? Uh, who were the people that lived there and trying to get to those stories all from maybe some, you know, handmade nails and the sole of a shoe. So <laughs> trying to build these stories from just bits and pieces of the past. After we know um, at the late 1800s, Colorado continue, continues to expand in many different ways, um, different kinds of mining, um, collapse of the mining industry to the uranium, mine, uh, uranium mining industry and so on. And so we just see this growth and growth and we can see that reflected in the archeological record too. So here we've got this huge period of time in Colorado. What does that mean for the people that live here in Colorado? Well. It's a great way, archaeology is a great way to get interest in the past. Um, kids, I love working with kids about archaeology. They get so excited, um, like working with artifacts and getting to see how things um, how, how things worked in the past, um, how you can get a story of the past based on what you find. Kids love arrowheads. And if, as long as you start to say the word dinosaur and then say, no, wait, we don't study dinosaurs. At least I got their attention. Um, archaeology is a great way for um, heritage and language reclamation um, because of like the Indian school boarding period. Um, there's a lot of erasure of um, indigenous language and um, culture. And so archaeology can work with present day indig indigenous communities to try to help reclaim um, culture and language to um, try to bring some of that back that was lost. Representation is uh, so crucial in an archaeology um, where we might have in some areas of the United States, um, there were, there was a lot of building on top of cemeteries that were um, created by former slaves in African American communities and um, building used to happen on them quite a bit. Well, archaeology has been used and um, as a way and a, and a tool to help find these cemeteries and then prove they are there, show they are there, and then provide representation and be like, look, you can't just hide the past. It's right here in front of us. And so our, there are a lot of archaeologists and it can be used as a way to help bring um, history that would otherwise be covered up. And we're seeing that with the um, uh, Indian boarding schools too, finding the um, graves there as well through all these different technological means and having archeologists and forensic anthropologists help with that. So archeology span can help a lot with representation. 
And then archaeology can work a lot with repatriation um, and a lot of agency collections at like Mesa Verde um, to, to the NRCS and all these places. We're not supposed to have um, certain things in our collections, like um, objects that were found in burials. And so archaeology can be used as a way to help give these items back to the descendants and get these things back to the people whose great great grandparents it belonged to. So yeah, so archaeology, um, there's a lot of great ways of working with communities. Um, and if it's something you're interested in, there's like the Colorado Archaeological Society. You don't have to be an archaeologist to be part of it. Um, it's just something fun to be part of. There's the site steward programs with the um, Bureau of Land Management where you can help record archaeological sites. So there's a lot of great ways to engage here in Colorado um, with archaeology. So what do you do if you find something? Um, the big thing is investigate it. Look at it. It's totally fine. Um, I mean, as long as it's not like a burial eroding out a hill and you don't start playing with human remains, that would be very bad. Um, investigate. So let's say you're walking on a trail. You find the coolest thing you've ever seen. It is the most amazing arrowhead. Take a picture, you know, document where you found it. Um, yeah, take photos. You can notify History Colorado, and that's where our state historic preservation officer is. If you're um, on a trail like at Rocky Mountain, let Rock, a Rocky Mountain um, interpreter know. The big thing is leave anything you find in place. If you're really worried somebody else is going to come along and because you found it right in the middle of the trail, but it's slightly off trail, but let somebody know immediately never take something with you. It's actually, um, when you're on public lands like park service, that kind of stuff, it is illegal to take anything from it. So you can't take pottery, arrowheads, um, a rock, um, and nothing. You can't take any of that kind of stuff. Geology, it's its own other thing, but anything cultural, um, you need to leave everything in place. If you have a contract with the NRCS and it's your land, if you have a contract with us, you need to wait to remove anything um, until someone like myself can come along, take pictures, take points, um, see if there's anything there we need to worry about before you remove something. And then the key thing to keep in mind is that it is illegal to disturb human remains, even if it's on private land. Now, I think probably 99.9% .9 of people would be like, I don't want to mess with that. But, you know, there are folks who, if they find um, ancestral Puebloan burials on their land, they may try to look for stuff. Um, whether it's a cemetery or um, a, a super prehistoric thousands and thousands of year old burial, um, it is illegal to disturb um, human remains in Colorado and federally as well, nationwide. So that's a big thing. Um, and that's one you definitely want to let people know if you find a burial on your land. Now to the especially fun stuff. What are common finds of things that you might find on your own land? Well, now the really cool stuff for a lot of people are arrowheads. And trust me, I love arrowheads. I wish I could find them all the time. You just don't find them as often as you would think. Um, so the big things that we typically find while working are historic artifacts. And a big one are little bits and pieces of broken glass. And those different pieces of colored glass can give you um, an age range. So something like purple glass, it's got like um, magnesium in it. And when the sun hits it, it turns purple. Well, that dates between 1885 and 1920. So if I find a whole bunch of purple glass um, at a site where there's a cabin, a barn, that kind of thing, I know that site probably dates prior to 1920. Um, you might find uh, aqua, um, bottles, bits of pieces, um, transformers from telegraph lines. Aqua glass dates to the 1920s as well, but was made even before purple glass. So all these different colors can tell us a lot of things and the maker's marks on the bottles can tell you a lot. So glass is a big one that people commonly find. Then tin cans, all the tin cans you can possibly imagine. But everything from your beer cans from the 1970s all the way back to your earliest type of cans. Um, it's called a hole and cap. It's got a hole and cap right here. Um, used through the early 1800s, through the 1900s. Um, that caused a whole lot of botulism. People got sick from those. So hole and cap 
were super problematic type of um, tin can. And then once we get to the type of tin cans we have today, which is your sanitary can. And so surprisingly enough, we've got hole in cap, hole in top, sanitary. Um, and those different types of cans can tell us how old a site is. Very popular are the baking powder tins. Um, we find those a lot, along with lard buckets. You know, what are you going to cook with? Not necessarily olive oil. You're going to cook with lard. So get a whole lot of lard buckets um, at mining camps and like old farmsteads. And, you know, those lard buckets, a lot of kids use those as lunch pails. So you might get um, some kid toys around those uh, lard buckets as well. Um, another big thing, pottery, little bits and pieces of porcelain, plates, those types of things. And then the other types of tin cans, you might get, you know, those uh, coffee cans from the 1960s and 50s to your tobacco tins um, of the early 1900s. And how those tobacco tins closed will let you know how old they are. Prince Albert was the most popular type. Um, and so if you've got uh, like a Prince Albert tin can, like you already know that's pretty old. And then once you see how it closes on the top, it can let you know, like, is it from World War II? Is it from World War I? Is it even older? Um, so there's this kind of stuff. And so like cans, glass, um, pottery, these things last really well um, on the landscape here in Colorado. Um, once you get down into closer to the Four Corners region, you're going to get a lot more prehistoric stuff. Um, we're going to get flakes from making stone tools, the stone tools themselves, a lot more pottery. And that's just because of um, who was living where at which time. And then a lot of our prehistoric stuff here out on the plains is buried. Um, so that makes a big difference too. It's like what tends to be on the ground surface, our soil type, um, and then what tends to last. And so here's some other stuff that's very common to find. Like I said, these are flakes up here in this left corner, upper left-hand corner. These are what happens when you're knocking rocks and trying to make a stone tool. These bits and pieces that fly off. And then you can make little tools from these bits and pieces. These are scrapers and flakes. Scrapers for like hides, um, trying to make a nice hide and that kind of thing. Other stuff, ditches. We have so many ditches here in Colorado, so you might have head gates. Over here, we have ground stone um, for making um, flour, that kind of stuff, like a flour from corn or cornmeal. Collapsing barns. And then these two over here, we have a lot of these, but they're hard to see. Here we have a teepee ring. And it's very hard to see the rings themselves. This is what would have held down the canvas or hides for a teepee. And then here's a prospect pit. And that was created for people who are trying to mine in the past, like just try to see, well, could there be um, some mica? Could there be silver? Could there be gold? And they would leave this pit. So these are the most common things that you would find in your own backyard. Um, if you're on like major ranch land, you might have teepee rings. If you're up in um, the forest and you got a lot of timber, you're probably gonna have prospect pits. Again, um, on the ranch land, you're probably going to have a lot of old historic buildings, barns, that kind of stuff. And if you're like ranch land and cropland, you're going to have ditches. You're probably going to have head gates. You're going to have um, division gates, all these types of things. And then if you're way out in the plains and you've gotten these old like hills and dune complexes and all this stuff where sand is eroding out, that's where you're probably going to have your prehistorics and your flakes and things coming out. So we've got a whole huge state of different things that you could find was the number one thing we're going to find? Tin cans. A whole lot of beer cans and tin cans. So <laughs> that's probably the number one thing I find a lot are beer cans from the 1960s. People liked their beer. Um, I hope I didn't bore you to tears <laughs> with this information. I'm very happy to answer um, questions. Um, I think the big thing to keep in mind is that with all this, we have just like an incredible rich history and prehistory and just like an incredible history of indigenous peoples here and that like, it's a living landscape and there's so much to learn. And so like, I highly recommend like going to um, the different museums. Um, at one museum I'm dying to go to is the Ute Museum um, down in uh, Montrose and, and I'm, wanting to go more to the Denver Museum and like all these unique places that will teach you more about the history and prehistory of this incredible state. Thank you, Emily. That was great. I, Yay! I, I wish we had all day to talk about this stuff because I have so many <laughs> specific questions. 
Um, but I guess one thing that comes to my mind, is there a way to relate? And I know this is not very common to find, but in general, like for pottery, for example, um, are there like very distinct features that relate some pottery to certain, like a certain tribe or group of people as opposed to others? Or is that more like you based out of just the location where you know that these people have historically lived? Oh, that's a wonderful question. And yes, actually, um, so based on just the material itself, like the makeup of the clay and then what's used temper to help it, you know, withstand high temperatures um, can help, you know, the location and generally where the pottery is from, but the design, the make, um, the type of paint that is used is, is very much a um, group by group type of, of thing. And so like the ancestral Poblon had a very specific um, design system. And then you look at the um, like other groups like in Arizona and you're looking at um, people like the Sanawa, they have a very, they have a different um, color palette that they might use. And so, yeah, it's very regional. And then when you're looking a little bit later, like uh, Plains groups might use um, different designs instead of paint. So they're like, they're etching into the clay itself. So yeah, there's a, a lot of different ways to tie the pottery you find to specific groups of people. Great. Um, I had a follow-up, but I forgot. But <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, I guess another question I have is like, what if you were, what if I was a landowner and I don't have a contract with NRCS, I just happen to find something, maybe an arrowhead or just anything that's old and I'm trying to figure out like should I leave it there or should I try to bring it inside and preserve it in some way like what's how do I go about that that's a wonderful question and so to be perfectly honest if you don't have any kind of tie to a contract whatever it's your land you can do with what you want to the limitation of cemeteries burials human remains so yeah you can take the arrowhead, you can put it in your house, you can do what you what you want with it. What, as an archeologist, what I recommend is always just leaving things in place because you never know what else you find. And then everything with that arrowhead is tied to everything else around it. So let's say then you found a teepee ring two years later, then you have to remember, well, was this where I found that arrowhead? Was that in the same location? Because everything is very location tied. Um, but I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. Like, yeah, you can leave it in place. Um, if you do want to take it with you, I highly recommend taking like a GPS point um, and some pictures of where you found it um, just for future research. Um, you can go to a historical society. You can go to History Colorado. You can contact one of the universities. Um, there's a lot of different ways if you want to get more research and more um, information about what you find too. Um, I always say when in doubt, leave it in place. But it's totally up to the landowner at that point. Yeah, awesome. Well, do we have any questions from the audience? And if you want to unmute yourself or type it in, either way works. Don't um, be shy. <laughs> <laughs> so this NRCS for like someone who is not involved in any contracts at all but if I wanted to reach out just for this specific topic is that a, a possibility or is that just not um, I mean, technically technically we pretty much we want to have with contracts just because just for the reason we're super busy yeah. but that being said um, I'm always happy to talk to people about archaeology. I'm always happy to help with that kind of stuff. I can't guarantee that I'd be able to like look at stuff or go out on the property or anything along those lines. But um, if you want to email me or um, call, that is that's something you're more than welcome to do. I just can't promise a lot of time, but I'm always happy to help. Um, and my email, so it's Emily Long, but there are lots of Emily Longs within um, within the federal government. So it's Emily period Long the number two at usda.gov. Otherwise you'll be emailing an Emily Long at the Forest Service. So I'm gonna type it in the chat. Um, sure. 
if anybody wants to reach out at some point. Um, but yeah, I guess if we don't have any more questions, um, thank you so much, Emily, for doing this. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. And again, uh, so much to talk about that it's so hard to summarize in a few minutes. So thank you for doing that. And uh, you're welcome. Yeah. So, and thanks everyone for joining today. I'm going to stop the recording.